to order the meeting of the Transportation Advisory Committee of May 19th, 2015. Lisa, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Anderson? Here. Mr. Batty? Here. Mr. Fielmesker? Here. Mr. Jessick? Here. Mr. Gary Johnson? Here. Mr. LaSalle? Here. Mr. McEnroth? Here. Mr. Steve Johnson? Here. Mr. Mahoney? Here. Uh, first item is approval of the minutes of April 22nd, 2015. Does anybody have any comments or corrections for those minutes? I do. Yes, sir. On, uh, on page 7, when we're at the top where they're discussing the, the Savage Mini Mall and the property that may or may not have been given away or taken or whatever, um, it should be clear that I was only talking about the property at the time of the development of that intersection and not previously to because when they did their initial development they undoubtedly gave away to the city property any other comments or corrections I had a couple of questions too on page one second line from the bottom where it says that uh, data does now show concerns with speeding on Center Street I thought the data showed there was not a problem. Oh, that's just, that would be, should show no, not a concern. So you're right. And I, I did review that in the video itself, so that was just a typo. And then also on page 8, two-thirds of the way down, Gary Johnson, Highway Administration Standards. It looks like you started to write something down there, but then never got back to it okay. page eight you said i'll review that in the video but you said page eight okay uh, yeah it okay. Starts, starts gary johnson dash highway administration standards okay. seven colon 39. okay yeah that, okay i'll review that okay. anything else okay we'll call for a motion I move that the minutes be adopted with the, with the uh, amendments and changes previously noted. I'll second it. Any further discussion? <clears throat> if you're absent from that, you just abstain when they approve the minutes? What's the protocol there? Well, there's two ways, ways of thinking about it. Um, you could abstain because you weren't there, but you could also watch it on the video so you would know what happened during that meeting. Yeah, I didn't watch it on the video. So I've just been reading be minutes, so I'll abstain. abstain. I wasn't here. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 <coughs> all opposed? And one abstention. Abstain. Okay. The agenda analysis, does anybody have anything they want to change or bring forward to the agenda for this evening? So um, there's a couple things that aren't on the agenda that, um, based on... John Anderson sent me an email and said, you know, it looks like a short agenda. Can you talk through a couple of the active, um, not a, I won't call it active transportation because that's a different topic, but uh, projects that might be transportation related that maybe Public Works is actively considering. So uh, I thought we'd go through those, a uh, couple of those, depending on how much time we have. But we could talk about the Myers Road ex um, extension project. We've made fair amount of progress on that. Um, Public Works Operations is working on an in-house project at Gaffney Lane near the, the school there, so talk about that little project. Um, we are looking at the idea of a couplet design um, in the downtown area on 14th and 15th, and um, we could talk about that one as well. And then Martin has made a lot of progress with ODOT on a bridge um, on the Highway 43, Oregon City, um, some signage that would um, <coughs> warn large trucks that there's not good access downtown, so um, prohibiting large trucks from using that bridge. That's so, the bridge over the, the Clackamas City River? Bridge, or <coughs> Highway 43 bridge. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some items that I think we may not get to all those topics. I guess we'll just leave that open. I don't want to. I don't want to carry the meeting too long, but um, there are a couple of 
interesting pieces there that hopefully we can we can talk through pretty quickly. And then I just noticed Michael Simon stepped in, so we don't have that on the agenda. Um, he submitted a fairly large packet. Um, Bob, I don't remember if you took a copy of that home. I know I've got a copy of it. Yes, that. and I studied it very thoroughly. Uh, I, it took me about three times going through it before I could really kind of understand where. So I started to review it, and I was realizing I was um, probably going to need to dedicate a few more hours to that. But yeah. um, but I think I got to the just of the the core of what I think is uh, Michael's point. So we could talk about that if you yeah. like as well. So. <coughs> I guess I'll let you, since you've studied that so well, you could maybe uh, lead that, and I will respond. Are you okay with that? Sure, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I've got a question, Bob, when you're... Okay, go ahead. Uh, John, uh, are we making any progress, or what, what's the status of the uh, left-hand turn uh, into... Uh, into Dutch Brothers. Has the city uh, <coughs> brought, brought that up for conversation? Not recently. We still have the study. Um, I, the, you know, the, the big issue there, in my opinion, is we don't want to make it worse, and certain actions could make it worse at that location. So we have, a, you know, the study work that was done that talked about various options, but I think the real solution is um, and, and is is finding funding for frontage improvements um, along 10th Street between the railroad and Main Street so that we can get a curb alignment over there and stripe that to provide a turn pocket that would still allow that left turn to happen, but it would do it in a way that um, it wouldn't be as annoying as I think it is for people now. What I saw the other day was uh, traffic backing up all the way out to McLaughlin. Uh, because of the left-hand turn into the driveway there. And people making that left-hand turn are just oblivious to what's happening behind them. And there are people taking chances at the intersection there on Main Street and the intersection on McLaughlin that uh, for, some, uh, for some unexplainable reason, they're making left-hand turns when there's no room for their car. And they're blocking up McLaughlin going north. And uh, it's it's it defies description, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, one of these days, it, it's not a matter of time. It's it just or what? It's it's if when <laughs> it's something's going to happen because of that. And the person making a left-hand turn will be oblivious as to what's happening behind them in terms of an accident that their action caused something, caused a reaction back behind them. So I guess the question I have because I. I recognize the the problem and the annoyance there. The question is, is um, the the options there aren't there aren't a lot of options there. Which and we've talked about that in this group here. Yeah, before. I understand. I understand. So um, prohibiting the left turn with a median of some sort, for mm -hmm. instance, um, has repercussions as well. That would limit them to. Um, a lot of vehicles to only using a Main Street ex entrance on the, at that particular facility. And that has potential to even cause another whole set of backup. And so, you know, and that combined with folks that drive and come up to this hilltop and make a U-turn and to use the left turn, that's, that's another problem. So I think that the solution there, that I think there is a solution that will make it better, but it's still not gonna make it perfect. But in order to do that, it's gonna cost some significant it's going to require some significant capital to build the curb and the sidewalk on the, across the street in a place where you can allow for a turn pocket there for people to be in. And then if that turn pocket gets filled, then, you know, there's, there's still potential for that to continue to back out onto McLaughlin and heavy traffic situations. Well, I think we're just uh, setting ourselves up liability-wise because we've talked with it. We know about it. And if we continue to... <coughs> <clears throat> to allow it to happen if something occurs, if I was an attorney, I'd say, hey, wait a minute. The city knew something was uh, afoot and didn't do anything to correct it. Uh, and that's the liability for coming from the other side, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's getting to that point where I, 
can't say that I don't care about Dutch Brothers, but I care more about the safety of the, of the driving public, is what I'm saying, because they don't have a clue what's happening. They don't. So you think it's you think it's I think safety. it's a public hazard. You think it's a hazard? Yes, yes, I do. I really do. Uh, it, it's just a matter of. Uh, a high-speed collision is going to t occur on McLaughlin because traffic was backed up and somebody took a chance. And uh, I didn't know that up ahead was, was a problem. And uh, it's just one reoccurring issue <laughs> that seems to be accumulating down there at that, you know, it's not McLaughlin, it's, it's up the hill too. Is, is well, virtually every neighborhood that I go to and visit them about safety issues, that subject comes up of that location. There may be very few solutions to the problem, but I would like to see us readdress that in the near future, Look, looking again at the diagrams that you had for suggestions for improvements. I also heard from somewhere that it was suggested to Dutch Brothers that they build another kiosk on the other side in that empty lot there, which would allow people coming off McLaughlin Boulevard to pull in. Instead of turning left across the street, they would just veer off to their right, <clears throat> and then we would have a barrier prohibiting left turns into the present Dutch Brothers location. But that, of course, would require capital expenditures on their part, and the city would lose a lot that they presently have for sale, which I'd be surprised looking at that lot that they ever sell it. <laughs> so I think that we owe the public at least uh, another overview of that whole situation. <clears throat> we can definitely bring back the report. Okay, what I think I'd like to do is, is go ahead and um, proceed with the agenda as written and then when we get down past new business discussion we can go into those new items that you brought up, John. Does that sound right to everybody? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so the next thing is citizen comments. So we have one person, Francesca Anton. <coughs> oh, bring your. I was talking. I was talking to him. You go ahead, Francesca. Hi, I'm Francesca Anton. I live at One Two Three High Street, and I am here on behalf of the McLaughlin neighborhood. Association Steering Committee. I'm secretary, so I'm busily taking notes because, as you all know, we always discuss traffic at all of our steering and general meetings. Um, so um, I'm really glad to be here. Did I remember to thank everybody for their hard work? <laughs> um, so we would just like to stay on board. We want to keep track of what's happening in the city. I just now read the minutes. So we want to know about uh, progress on traffic calming. Um, we want to know if, uh, I guess it was mentioned that there was a citywide slowdown campaign and we were wondering if that has um, gone through the city commission yet and if there's um, action going on that. I'll just ask my questions and I'll sit down and maybe you can answer them. And um, so we want to know if the City Commission is on board with that. Um, we would like to know when it would start and how we can be involved. Because we there's many, many people who would really like to be involved. And I know it's not just in the McLaughlin neighborhood. There's lots of talk between neighborhood associations right now about this. Um, we were wondering about the $5,000 that was allotted for traffic calming. Does that sound right? That's something I don't know about, but that was asked for me to bring up. And um, 
I'm done. I just want to say that I absolutely agree with you, Mr. Mahoney, um, on your concerns about Dutch Brothers. I have seen so many near misses, I cannot tell you. It's the only time I ever feel like honking my horn. <laughs> Okay, and I also am really interested about the truck, trucks coming through over the bridge and into downtown. And I can tell you, Mr. Lewis, that many, many of them travel on High Street. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not really those, great those, either. <laughs> those, those probably aren't the trucks that were yeah. trying to prohibit. But, but I'm, I'm just so surprised that these great big semis come down through High Street, you know? That they're actually delivering to Minute Market and such places. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering if there's something we can do to limit the delivery systems for these companies to make them bring smaller trucks or... Nobody uses the smaller trucks anymore. <sighs> it's just amazing. Well, and you know, it's just that so many people, their houses are almost practically on the sidewalk. So when these trucks go by, it's just really a big deal. Okay, so if you could answer those questions, I will take your comments back to the meeting in, in May and June. Thank you. Okay, in response to some of those questions, our main subject in tonight's meeting is the traffic calming uh, safety campaign that we're starting to put together, which was John's statement of $5,000 set aside in his budget for that. And we are not proceeding further with that until we get all our ducks in a row. Uh, I'm planning to have a meeting, John and I, and, and hopefully the city manager and the chief of police to get uh, our ducks in a row before we go forward with it. We want to have a plan in place that we can present to the city commission. So we don't want to go before them and seem <coughs> unorganized and reduce our chances of getting help. And. Uh, the, McLaughlin Neighborhood Association, of course, you're always more than welcome to any of our meetings and give us your input at all times, as, as all the other neighborhoods are, too. So I, th I hope that that answers some of your questions. Okay. Michael Simon. Thank you. Uh, after meeting, I realized I kind of clumsily um, not really numbered things or made my uh, report a little harder to track. So I uh, numbered all the pages with pencil and I printed out a bunch of other ones. So I think it would be easier to read, although it's kind of a technical read as it is. I, I found that out for sure. <laughs> Well, I think that I printed up ten of them. Okay, so that, that would kind that, of that should be sufficient. Yeah, I think I've got enough strength. <laughs> <laughs> and how about if I hand them out for you? Thank you, Henry. So, Michael. Um, this is this is uh, a lot more work than I've ever seen from a volunteer, so I'll just say that right off the top. And it was a little hard to follow for me beca because of the page numbers and the reference numbers, but I just can tell you put a lot of energy into this, so I don't want to downplay that. I was wondering though if um, if you could give a if you could kind of summarize your your message because I think what I heard from you was this boils down to frustration from uh, yourself and and maybe others about how the how traffic speeds are established and changed and what you know how maybe the public should be involved in that more yes when, on this particular uh, instance uh, the elected officials and the public had no idea what was going on and by the time there was really uh, input, um, it was already a sealed deal. And I guess I should say for the record, this we're talking about um, Lynn Avenue from pretty much the hilltop down to 5th. Is that 
Is that the range? That's kind of what I, I did my research on, although it includes that entire corridor from Highway 213 and Myers and Leland and, and then Lynn. They were all involved in that. And um, people just didn't quite understand what was going on, nor, nor the elected officials had no idea what options might, might be. And people were led to uh, the impression that ODOT was the uh, agency that did all this, and they weren't aware of the uh, protocol. And I wasn't really until I got my second uh, letter from uh, then Senator Schrader's office, and they clearly laid out the uh, the rules for that. We referenced. 12, I think. And um, by the time there was a, a public meeting and Bill Daniels uh, presented the McLaughlin neighborhood's objections to it, it had already been accepted and, uh, and was a done deal at that point. And then the, um, there were some very misleading uh, Things like on the speed uh, zone request form, um, it suggested that there was public um, input into this when really, as far as I could tell, it was two anonymous phone calls. And so two, just using the language, some wanted higher posted speed, some wanted lower. That's not the way you would uh, express. You'd say one wanted this, one wanted that. And a sample size really needs to be at least 10 to be able to do statistics on it. And then the form that was sent out with a timeline there's a date that uh, suggests, and that would be reference to page two, that suggests the city commission heard testimony from citizens regarding the speed zone on and on June 6, 206. Well, there was not a city commission meeting that. I'd like to interject date. there. If you'll look at that document, it uh, references a sequence of events follows at the beginning of that document. Right. And if you follow the sequence of events, you'll see that June 6, 2006 Misplaced. should have been June 6, 2007. And right. But when I looked at that, I, I uh, tried to trace it down and figure it out. But somebody who was just reading it as a forum, like, say, uh, Senator Schrader's office, yeah. unless they double-checked it, they'd have no idea. It looks like, oh, there's public testimony. And well, then, I think I, I haven't been able to look at the minutes of June 6, 2007, but there may have been testimony. I can't say there whether there was or not. It was from Bill Daniels, and, and uh, he did talk about how citizens were concerned about Lynn Avenue. So really, the mm -hmm. it's kind of illogical to do it this way. Um, well, it was after that was after the fact then. It was not only after the fact. It was kind of the same. It was referring to his uh, letter that he read into the minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'm calling it a mistake, but it would, if you were reading this, you'd have to uh, do research to find out that actually it didn't occur. Mm -hmm. And so basically on this process, the, the public or the residents were totally unaware of, uh, of this. They had no, uh, they weren't able to express their opinions. And then reading through the minutes, you can see that um, uh, the elected officials didn't understand what was going on. And there's an email from uh, then Mayor Norris uh, expressing her notion of what was going on. And it was that ODOT does all this. And ODOT uh, must receive a request, and the speed that the city requests must be stated on that. 
And then the city has a leeway of 10 miles per hour above or below any uh, recommendation by ODOT on a speed. So the city did have leeway on all this. And the impression one gets is that the city was uh, under the thumb of ODOT. You know, I'd like to have a clarification on that because we've always understood that whatever ODOT decided was to be the speed limit, that was it. That was cast in stone. But in this information that Mr. Simon gave us, and I don't know where you were referring to, 734-020-0015, is that a state uh, ordinance, or what is that? Sounds like oh, that's how the ODOT uh, speed manual, the oh. 2007 August okay. edition. So the quote here is, part of this is, the recommended speed may be varied a maximum of 10 miles per hour above or below the computed speed on city streets. To me, that sounds like it's at the city's discretion if ODOT uh, recommends 35 miles an hour after their studies, then the city could make it 25 or 45, which is far different from what we've been told in the past that whatever ODOT says is cast in stone. I've always understood it to be they, they go through the due diligence, they provide a professional recommendation. Anything varies from their recommendation? Uh, sounds, I'd, I'd need to read that particular uh, organ rule, but um, the city then takes on a fair um, burden of liability associated with uh, any accidents or any problems that happen that are contrary to the ODOT's recommendation. Mm -hmm. So there may be that opportunity to do that, but um, there may be liabilities far above see, what yeah. we would do if we accepted their um, recommendation. But I... Um, we don't do speed studies that often. I guess um, when we have done them, it's been at the request of the, usually through the Transportation Advisory Committee and a conversation that happens and then typically we hear that and we've got consensus that this group, we send that request to ODOT and then ODOT puts it on a schedule. I think we've got one right now that we've kind of been waiting for them. There's like one guy in the state that does all the speed studies across the state. It's and typically a six-month <coughs> process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it takes several months to even get them to come to town. And then once they come to town, they do that work without public involvement. They bring a professional in who's used to doing that work. And he um, looks at a lot of input, a lot of data. He looks at any traffic information the city has. He um, he makes a professional decision based on speeds that uh, that are that are being utilized. Usually, it's around that 85th percentile speed. Um, if there's recommendations for additional <coughs> signing, they'll make those those signage changes. But speed, the the one piece that I think uh, what's interesting about Lynn Avenue, I think, is I remember a little bit of this. Mostly, I remember Nancy's kind of frustration with all the the politics that kind of played into that. Typically, we don't see that with speed studies. So if you remember Washington Street, that's the one speed study that I think many of this committee sat in on. We said, hey, after we did the jug handle project, it became apparent that coming into town or going out of town, we had, I don't know, three different three different speed zones posted along Washington Street, and the, including Clackamas Drive. So we asked them to come in and look at that, and out of that came a recommendation for a consistent speed limit through there, with the exception of the roundabout, which has got its own 15-mile-an-hour advisory signage. But So with that, th that was the recommendation that the, we got from the ODOT report. We heard that. We shared that with the committee. I think, I don't know if we took, took a motion at that time to accept that, but it's been re-signed to, to that recommendation. There was very little other than at this committee um, a, I don't. I don't consider this committee doing much in the way of politics. It was. It was a. It was a study that was completed. Uh, we accepted it. We reviewed it. It made sense to us. We had consensus, and we posted it that way. That's typically how speed studies are initiated and and implemented. Lynn Avenue uh, got sideways politically, and I think that added to the. The confusion, but I think at the end of the day, um, the city engineer at the time, which was Nancy, made the decision to uh, accept the ODOT uh, recommendation 
and implement that. I don't recall, I'd have to look into it, whether or not the, the city commission acted on that or not. That's, that would be unusual. We typically don't. John? The requested speed that uh, uh, Mr. Frazier sent in was uh, requesting, the city requested 35 miles per hour on that. And that whole corridor comes from Highway uh, 213 uh, through Myers and Leland uh, and Lynn. Um, and the end of Myers Road, I, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with what that looks like, but it doesn't look like 35 miles per hour to me. And none of these streets um, along the whole corridor, a good percentage of it, meets the definition of uh, a minor arterial. And I posted that in this too. Um, well, I think that not only that street, but every street, almost every street in the city would not meet the criteria for whatever street it is because of the lack of sidewalks. Well, this is sidewalks and trip uh, uh, distances are less, and then speeds are less than on major arterials. And Malala Avenue being listed a major arterial uh, changes the 35, um, kind of as it go, becomes the old Malala Avenue before it uh, is the new highway now, um, and then changes down to uh, 30 at Homes. And so this corridor is 35 from 213 all the way down to Jackson Street. So it's <coughs> well, I think that what, that what you I I really appreciate all the work you've gone into this, and I think what your objective is is to try to get that down to 25 miles an hour. My objective, my well, my real objective is is that um, the system, the the process, uh, just excluded uh, people. Uh, but and, that um, was then. And we can't do anything I've got to change degrees that. in science. I mean, I know how to. Uh, I, I know the 85th percentile is scientific. On a, a roadway with no uh, kids living alongside the street or uh, bicyclists or pedestrians, but without considering those variables, it's just um, not real. It's not a real science study. It's ignoring uh, too many factors. Well, well, I don't know <laughs> that's a, that's that we can do anything about that now. The only, the only solution to that uh, would be to present just cause to representatives from the Oregon Traffic Safety Transportation Committee and the Oregon State Police, the Association of Oregon Counties, the League of Oregon Cities, and ODOT. And I think that, in order to show just cause, would would mean a whole other traffic study. The, um, and I don't think that just cause could be proven from the, uh, the past record. And th that was the case at the first uh, public meeting, but um, it had already been a, a signed deal, uh, honey, I bought the house. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was already a done deal at that time, and there was a lot of public comment after it was a done deal. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, there was no comment at all. And then I worked in the medical field, but I, uh, in forms we filled out, we were told were legal documents. And it, it seems like you have legal documents that convey misinformation, then technically I'm not sure it's even valid. I, I would think personally a process and a, a, a system that should be, it should be open, uh, it should be inclusive, and it shouldn't just be a, 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 the ends justify the means uh, mode of operation. And it's clear to me that Nancy wanted a, a corridor from Highway 213 uh, down to Jackson Street at 35 miles per hour. Well, well I, I personally have never been involved in a traffic decision or study of this nature. But the data so supported I couldn't that, tell you. That, that speed prior to the speed being changed. There's no uh, traffic enforcement in Oregon City, so people do tend to go that fast. And Alice Norris, in her letter to Tim Gleason, said she lived on Linda Avenue and was uh, worried about the speed, too. And uh, it has been a point of contention all along for, for a long time. And um, 
So I've driven for a while. I noticed, you know, in Oswego, people go 25 miles per hour mostly because they'll catch a ticket if they don't. And then as you approach the 35 mile an hour sign, you can see it, then people begin to speed up for it. We have an agenda item to talk about enforcement, and we've asked the police department to show up. So they're going to talk about enforcement um, today because there have been some increases in enforcement around town. But I think it, I, what I, my takeaway from what your point was was that you would like the process to include m more um, subjective input from the neighborhood. And I think traffic speed studies are generally not a voter approved kind of initiative. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't do a different, consider doing traffic studies differently for people that live along the corridor and notification of them of that. That's not a code requirement, but that may be something we should consider doing. And you know, again, reading the Oregon law, especially if they, if that Oregon law requires us or suggests that we should do it that way, I, we're, we we could change our process there. But for the most part, this Lynn Avenue, um, before and after the study, the speeds that people use Lynn Avenue were consistent with the decision of ODA, which is a 35 mile an hour speed limit. So I just I just want to I, I think we need to wrap this up. But I mean. The, We've got uh, an, an accepted speed study. Um, I, I think you're right, trying to get them back here without any real changes to that speed study or without the um, changes to the roadway are going to be difficult for them to come back and redo. Um, we do have some, we do have a quarter plan, so that's another public process that we've gone through to adopt a, a quarter plan for that area that shows for more improvements along there. Now, when we implement those is a pretty big question, but um, I think the city has been inclusive in its in its um, recommendations for this corridor. Um, and I, I'd like to believe, I wasn't a part of it, but I'd like to believe that included the speed study to the degree we could. Um, you guys, some of you, Scott, you're shaking your head. You might remember that a little bit better. I, I don't know if you can speak to that. We went through all that. Yeah. So. Um, well, would it be practical when there is a study of this nature coming up to notify the neighborhood associations? The public did come talk. Yeah. I mean, that might be a, an outreach that would have maybe helped this particular issue. There's nothing we can do about this now, but in the future. Uh, because I know as a neighborhood chair, when I get something from the city, I do my best to try to pass it on to the neighbors. We only meet Park Place three times a year, but at least we get a lot of information out to them. So, Debbie Corey in here in a letter to Tim Gleason says that they rarely get requests from the city to increase speeds. That usually it's a request to lower speeds. Yeah. So this was kind of an unusual request. Yeah. And it's definitely a residential neighborhood. You can't drive down any through any of those uh, streets and not think, oh, I'm in I'm in a residential neighborhood. They are residential neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And to me, the way my head works, it looks like uh, the mindset was you have cedar uh, slat fences, um, a little a cement wall, a sidewalk, and streets, and kind of an alley of uh, cedar fences with a 35 mile an hour speed through it, like some of the areas in Beaverton or these new areas that are developing now. But these old areas aren't that way, and they wouldn't modify that way. Mm -hmm. Well, they were built in the, a lot of in the days of the Model T. But I really think we have to call this part of the conversation tonight to a close because we have several other issues. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you for your efforts. It is kind of a difficult read. It's pretty technical. New business discussion items. Public works report. Um, so um, we've got on here city citywide safety campaign update, and I think um, I've been talking to Chief Band and, you know, sharing him a little bit. I haven't shared with him some of the slogan information that we shared, but just this idea of trying to implement a safety command, get a safety um, campaign, not command, safety campaign 
and trying to get some buy-in at the police department level. So Bill, Bill Clure is here to talk. I, what, I, what I wanted to put together was something that was more focused on a couple of the initiatives that the police department's pursuing with regard to safety and try to get some of that buy-in that you were talking about, at least at the department level, so that then we could um, pr pursue that with the city manager and possibly get it on the agenda and get some buy-in from the city commission. So, so um, we could end up with the transportation advisory committee being the people's hero there you go there you go if that's what you're looking for you yep. get that you bet yeah. you my legacy although you know <laughs> <laughs> i was just going to say that, Robert. you beat me to it <laughs> so la but last week um we shared some ideas and just kind of you know it was new information uh there was to the degree i can assign homework we tried to assign some homework um on you know what you thought about the slogans what you thought about the messaging and the audience i don't know bob if you want to lead the the committee through that conversation to see if we've got any consensus on the the other than the consensus that i heard was slow down campaign and it, you know if we can to the degree we can uh, uh utilize the concerns of the community which is usually wrapped around children's safety we should do that but um, I don't know. Other than that, we didn't. I didn't. We didn't come up with any real fresh ideas, did we? We just. We just pretty much have the safety slogans that we've seen out there, and uh, you know we're still willing to pursue those kind of slogans. Um, but again, trying to take that to say school children or school districts or or our school district. <clears throat> we talked about safety placemats for restaurants and distributing those. You know I. Those are things that I think would be more of a volunteer effort. And I don't know if this committee was wanting to um, sponsor any of that or not. But if we did, it'd be good to get some direction there too, so that we can actually pull together what what the recommendation is from the TAC on on those kind of you know measures as well. So with that, I'll open it up, and then we can we can ask um, Bill Clare what point he wants to. Or you, you're ready for him to kind of share? Let's, let's have him share it before we get into the other stuff. Like John said, I'm uh, Bill Clare. I'm a captain of the Oregon City Police Department. And um, I was asked to just come up and give you a, a brief uh, um, presentation about what we're doing to uh, implement a safety plan. Um, John Lewis and Chief Band are uh, working on a bigger scale um, for a for a longer project, but this is just what we're doing currently. Um, you may know about our safety, um, our traffic safety class that uh, Judge McNeese has the option to send um, violators to. If you haven't had a, a citation within three years and you have a violation of um, such as speeding, failure to obey a traffic control device, seat belt, cell phone violation, or following too close, um, she has the ability to send you to a safety class um, in lieu of a um, larger fine and a sentencing for the, would you go on your driving record so we implemented that class in January of 2014 and um, we had 800 people go through the class um, to date and we're getting some great response from the people going to the class such as everybody should take this class um, I was coming into this class you know not very motivated but I came out with some, some very good information and um, it's, it's been very um, well received we've always offered this class but we never offered it locally we always offered it they had to drive over to Portland community college to go to it and it was really outdated material this is more, more local um, our officers uh, are teaching it and we're getting some great response um, and some great feedback from it we do a survey after the after the uh, every class um, and the survey is rated from one to five on different uh, topics and um, we're averaging 4.5 um, positive feedback on each of the uh, uh, different questions we ask so um, it's been a very successful class, and it's, it's good to keep it here home in, in Oregon City. Um, another thing we've done recently is uh, we're trying to implement a traffic team. Um, we have one and a half traffic officers currently, although one's injured, so he's off the, uh, off the road for the next six months or so. So we currently have um, just a half a person dedicated just to traffic. Uh, he's working 20 hours a week. He's a retired um, um, OSP trooper. And um, he writes about a thousand, or excuse me, about a hundred uh, citations a month. Um, 
so he's he's out there um, we we dispatch him to um, neighborhoods and wherever we have um, you know problems or concerns um, to off the top of my head I know High Street's been a concern 99 is a concern Center Street's been a concern recently Barkley Hills has been a concern um, and then he's on um, trying to tackle the uh, major intersections as well which are pretty hard to work with a, you know with a vehicle and with a person um, which I'll get to some other solutions that we're looking into for the, 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 the um, um, intersections so um, but as an agency for citations um, we do have a quota for our officers um, each officer is uh, mandated to write 10 citations a month and three of those citations um, must be a uh, moving violation so it must be a failure to obey a traffic control device a speeding or something of that sort um, you know it's not something that we're proud of but it's something that we think is necessary to uh, minimize uh, traffic crashes as well as speed and all the other violations we see being the county seat you know we see an influx of uh, people coming to the community and it's um, it's a burden for our, for our, um, officers to uh, regulate so we, we ask them to get out there and we force them to do so um, so as the agency uh, we, we write about 500 tickets a month um, on average how, how does that stack up against similar communities it's funny you should ask uh, I just talked to a captain at the Milwaukee PD and um, they do not have a um, a quota or a performance objective whatever they want to call it but they do have one officer writing citations on a motorcycle and they write about 200 a month and I know Gladstone doesn't have a uh, um, performance objective either or a traffic team so um, we're the only ones with a quota in the metropolitan area that I'm aware of at least we'll admit that we have a quota and we, we have our officers out there writing citations because we're concerned about it our traffic stats as uh, uh, Mr. Lewis and Chief Ban know um, are pretty incredible with our traffic crashes and again I, I, I personally believe and I think stats will um, indicate that it's the county seat people are flooding here and going to appointments getting to work and we've got major highways coming through town so it's uh, it's it's a major concern hey I'm Bill yes. can you the uh, I was intrigued by the one retired officer from OSP and Jim's kind of depiction of um, or uh, a state patrol and I don't know if this is typical or not but he's just you know typically state patrol officers write a lot of tickets so they're they're more likely so maybe talk about that and then I wasn't sure how long he'd been kind of in on that traffic position is that new or yeah it's new within the last two months um, he was an OSB trooper for 25 years he was doing some court bailiff stuff for us with our municipal court and um, again trying to be creative and coming up with more solutions of uh, trying to calm traffic down um, we invited him over to the PD site to to do work part-time um, for citations um, another factor was our fact that our our one traffic officer got injured so he was uh, on the shelf for several months and still is um, our goal is to have a three-man traffic team a three full officer traffic team that's our goal um, we're talking to uh, finance and um, mr. Frazier about adding a position um, specifically for traffic um, and that will get us closer to our, our goal of a three-man traffic team we how, don't want to turn into Milwaukee you know and be, <laughs> and be that agency but we do want to control traffic and we do want to monitor these intersections to uh, to minimize the crashes how are you guys going to measure the performance I mean like against the crashes or I mean have you noticed any improvements now that you have personnel there or we haven't had the consistency to um, to do any measurements no um, we have crash data from ODOT um, it's I, I think Chief Ban has given a presentation about that in the past and it's remarkable it's um, um, equal to the cities such as Bend which is three times our size like 80,000 people so our traffic crash stats are comparable to their traffic crash stats which is remarkable um, so we haven't had the opportunity to have it long term enough to to put anything together yet um, to John's note um, yeah troopers that's what they do they, they chase tail lights and write tickets so he's uh, very creative and um, um, he isn't afraid to uh, for an example Highway 213 and Beaver Creek Road huge intersection as you guys know but it's very difficult to get a police car down there somewhere to work that intersection if you will um, you know, there's just really nowhere to hide if you will or nowhere to, to be safely in order to 
not only monitor the traffic, but then if someone blows an intersection or blows the light or you know does something silly to go get that vehicle. So there's a lot of factors involved trying to uh, not only watch the intersection, but then trying to get to that, in that violator <coughs> safely. Um, which brings me to my next topic is uh, red flux. Again, I'm not sure if Chief Ban has mentioned this here, but I know he has in other um, committees or other meetings he's uh, been involved with. Red flux is a um, photo red light um, system. So it's not a photo radar, it's not uh, determining speed, it's simply a photo red light system. We uh, ha are in um, conversations with them. Um, they have done a study for us in, I think, five different locations. And the top two locations are um, exactly the top two locations that are indicated by ODOT, um, Highway 213 in Beaver Creek. And believe it or not, the other one is um, Highway 99 at 14th. So this system, um, the system is, you know, there's these big flashing bulbs uh, on the entire intersection. And it doesn't trigger it until the light turns red. And then it uh, has these sensors that, that uh, knows the car is going to, it's going too fast to um, stop at the, uh, at the light safely. So it's going to arm and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take pictures of this vehicle going through the, uh, through the intersection. Um, the, the companies out of Phoenix, they, uh, they check the registered owner um, information against the photo. And if it's close, they send it to us at the PD. We have a traffic officer um, look at those um, citations and vet it, if you will, and then hit the go button and it's sent out by mail. Um, it's got to be sent out within 10 days. Sherwood does it, Tualatin does it, Portland does it. There's a lot of agencies around the Metropolitan, Beaverton does it. A lot of um, agencies around the Metropolitan area using this system already, um, and it's, it's effective. Is there a um, notification only, or is there a fine involved? Well, our discussions are we would do a, uh, a, not a, a grace period, you know, for one, one, one month we would do a grace period. Of course, we do education with the public as well beforehand, but we would do a, a one-month warning uh, grace period prior to uh, um, the actual citations. There's also uh, typically for these installations a lot of signage at your city entries that say we're a red light district and or not a red light district. <laughs> 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 Speed course by our photo radar. Not yeah. yet anyway. We know where John John Lewis's mind is in these meetings. This is like slow down. Just like right there. Right right there. Right. Like, like Who would you send a notification <laughs> to in that regard? <laughs> <laughs> the home address, the why? The, the registered owner. The, the registered owner. <laughs> yeah. You mean the red light district? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not yeah. talking about that. <laughs> so, That's another problem. <laughs> yeah. So I have I have a lot of experience as a management person in the HVAC business with those red light cameras. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I kind of <laughs> liked them as a manager because I would get the citation to my yeah. desk and then I'd call the service technician or the installer and then compliment them on what a nice, nice picture they take. <laughs> <you know? laughs> those and there was, there was no if, yeah. ands, or buts about it and they got to pay the fine. Yeah, the photos are incredible. I mean, they get right yeah. inside the car and I like snap the front and back and... Um, they're pretty incredible. So if the person is operating a vehicle, let's say they borrowed the vehicle or it's not, so it's not the actual person, yeah. do they end up, the person that borrowed the vehicle don't pay the fine or how does that work? Well, <laughs> if a person got a citation and it wasn't their vehicle, um, the registered owner could simply come and say, look, I got this citation and, and it's not me clearly and it would be thrown away. Okay. It would be thrown out. Um, that's how it would work. I, I, I don't know what the percentage of um, citations that that Get goes into play. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know it's very small, um, but I don't have the exact number. Again, these are preliminary conversations we're having this Red Flux company. They did do this survey for us. Um, so back to the survey. They did a 12-hour study. So they actually put these temporary cameras up. And um, at uh, Highway 99 and 14th, out of 12 hours, there were 20 red light violators. And on Highway 213 in Beaver Creek, there were 50 in 12 hours. So you know, again, well, remind you that that doesn't a lot. ignite, or uh, ignite's probably not the right word, but that doesn't engage until the light turns red. So the light is physically red before that car enters the, uh, um, the, cro the crosswalk or the stop line. So if the person was already in the intersection, let's say, I mean, they couldn't stop, it's yellow and they're already in the intersection, did they also get I don't believe so, but I don't quote me on it. I believe they've got to be outside the intersection and then coming into oh, it and, and, and approaching it, but I'm not positive. Yeah. The system 
it, it's reading through a camera what your approach speed is, and it's calculating at the speed that you're traveling, will you enter this intersection prior to it turning red or just before it turns red? Okay. And what, what it has, this is from a couple meetings that I've sat in with Bill, um, it arms it as it's getting ready to go when it's in amber, and then it engages it to ready to fire when it's red. Oh, okay. But the algorithm is reading your vehicle as it's approaching and calculating the speed. Um, in Sherwood, as, as being a happy recipient of one of these, <laughs> um, you know that it it can tell you the, the speed you were coming through the intersection. It can tell you the time, the date, your photo. There's a big snapshot of your front tag. There's a big snapshot of your back tag, and there's a big snapshot of your face. And let me tell you, if there's somebody in your passenger seat, they get blurred out and try explaining that to your wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, it's but, almost like the story my driving instructor told me. He got one of these in the mail for his pickup, only he wasn't in it. His wife and his girl, her girl, her boyfriend was. Oh. <laughs> um, another um, factor with this red flux is um, they consider it a halo effect. Um, they have data that indicates that, that there's a halo effect. So if, you know, all the signage and people understanding that there's um, the cameras there in time, um, there's a five block radius halo effect. So they, their studies indicate that within five blocks of that intersection, um, people tend to drive a little bit better mm -hmm. and, uh, and follow those rules a bit more as well. Um, which would bring us down to, you know, if we did, were to do 14th and 99, then we're all the way back to the intersection at 99 and um, 205, and then, you know, up through 99 through um, 10th and so. So that's uh, advantageous as well, such as a police car. You know, you see a police car, have somebody pulled over, and you're probably going to put your seatbelt on, you're probably going to slow down or, you know, do whatever and drive a little better for a period of time. So the same halo effect, but uh, they have data indicating it's a five-block uh, radius. Well, and that's our signage. Helps. Is there signage uh, prior to that area that indicates entering a red light photo zone or something? Yeah, like as that? well as in the city, like John mentioned, um, um, every avenue into the city as well would have to have signage. No. Okay. Now, do you guys have a photo radars in a vehicle that you could just park and take the picture? No, no. no. Uh, the, the trailer we do have um, collects data, but it doesn't, um, um, it, it doesn't collect. It doesn't. Stop photos. Yeah, it's, it's just for awareness for the driver. And just for clarification, because I know this has been brought up before and it was mentioned to us by the representative for this company, state law only allows six communities in the entire state to do mobile photo radar enforcement from um, the information that the gentleman we spoke with. Six company or six communities got it, put it in place, and then the state legislature said no more. And those six are grandfathered in. The anyone else coming in after, if you want to do a mobile radar installation, state law prohibits it. Is that right? And I looked it up. It's yeah. correct. I believe Milwaukee's discontinuing their um, photo radar program. I'm seeing the truck there. So do you have Arizona did too. Do you have Sorry, to know Arizona the, stopped oh. theirs too. Gary, did you happen to know the uh, section of the Oregon Revised Statutes that governs? Uh, Photo enforcement for red lights? I don't know off the top of my head. I looked it up after we met with um, Bill and Jim and this gentleman, what was that, nine months ago? So, yeah. Yeah, well, I, months I have ago. a copy of or Oregon Revised Statutes 810.438, which is, uh, addresses photo ra radar, but you said this was not photo radar. Photo red light. So I didn't know if there was another section that uh, addressed that specifically. And for this, which I thought address speeding mostly like there were uh, 10 locations 10, ten communities that were per permitted to uh Did it uh, excluded after that i know there are six communities in the state that are currently doing it based on the conversation that we'd had with this gentleman and the oregon city is, is one of the communities yeah, we were granted it but we just never um, <coughs> no. took advantage of it how many can they get through the intersection because i'm down here at the freeway where it comes when you come off the freeway on the 99, sometimes there's three and four people. Yeah, I'm not sure how quickly it arms to get to the next one, but uh, the, this technology is pretty incredible. I would imagine it mm -hmm. would... Uh, um, it does send you a link when you um, when it takes a photograph. It also uploads uh, a brief 10-second, 5-second video associated with that. And what that is extremely helpful with is reconstruction of a crash incident because the police department gets access to that as well. 
you know, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on air traffic control, and necessarily <laughs> so. But don't you think it's headed in that direction for major intersections and highways that we have an automatic traffic control system that's hmm. that's uh, 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 computerized and that it will not allow uh, these things to occur in that area because they're they're smart highways. Yeah, well, car. smart cars. Yeah. Well, Google mm -hmm. will have your car driving yourself or driving for you pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, so. we call that Big Brother. Yeah. Well, if it means saving lives. Oh, absolutely. You know, really. Right. You know, the distracted driving is, you know, obviously an issue as well. Um, so some of the things we're doing is some grants that we have uh, access to is that we have a pedestrian safety grant, um, which you may have seen. Uh, we did a, a detail recently um, where we get a decoy out there and, and put them in a, in a crosswalk. And um, we typically just write warnings or give warnings. We don't really write them uh, citations typically. Um, so we just give them warnings and just kind of a educational awareness type scenario. Um, we have a safety belt grant that we're doing currently. Um, we have a distracted driving grant that we're going to do um, in the upcoming months with kind of the cell phone, try to, to, to get people to put their cell phones down and educate them about uh, distracted driving, which is a factor with cra a lot of the crashes out there as well. Are, are you guys going to the like a high school and you know and trying to do? How much educational effort do you guys put in there? Yeah, our school resource officer teaches at the high school and also teaches at the driver's ed class at the high school, um, driver's safety and driver's ed. Aren't you going to be up at Hilltop real soon at that uh, public uh, safety celebration they're going to be having up there? Safety, the safety fair up at the yeah, Denison's? Safety fair. Yeah, we participate in that every year. I'm not I sure when that, it is, but I know we participate in it. Coming up this weekend, isn't oh, it? Oh, is it? I think so. So it's going to rain this weekend then? Yeah, of course. Because it rains every year. It's Memorial Day, <laughs> Day weekend. So well, if I could ask them, too, there are two people left listed on the re registration. Who is the citation? Uh, that's when the Phoenix Company would match um, if it was a male driver um, and, a male, and, a, and the male is on the registered owner. You know, and then they do like a date match or a, a birth date match and a similarity. Then they'll send it out. Then it's if it's not you, it's up to you to contest it. And okay. it's no, not me and this is why. Is, are the uh, photographs public information where somebody could just come in and page through all the photographs to see which who might be a passenger in the car that would be driven by a violent? I don't have information on that. I don't know. I don't know. I know that Sherwood makes their, um, when you come to contest a ticket, before you see the judge, they make you watch the video. Because <laughs> you have an option to watch it online, but you know if you don't watch it online... Um, they make you watch it before you go and see the judge. The court, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's it's that good a video. It's plain as day who it is, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so that's just some of the things that we're working on. Um, in addition to uh, what, what John Lewis and Chief Band are working on is with this with the um, citywide um, traffic safety plan. But uh, that's what I had to offer. So, if you guys staff up, you're 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 wanting to have like three individuals. We're wanting to have a three man traffic team. We yeah. That's that's our goal. Um, do you guys have like an idea how many tickets? I mean, do you, are you going to set a quote for those three guys in addition to individual police officer? You know, um, we we've had it before. We've had a traffic team before, and historically, um, we require a traffic a guy dedicated to traffic to write ten a day. So, depending on how many he, how many days he works that month, it usually averages a hundred a month per traffic officer. Because they got you know court and time off and so it usually averages around 100 a month. So Bill, I just want to say that um, I walked to lunch today, and out here on Center Street, your officer—I don't know if it's—I don't know if it's this officer or not—but they had somebody pulled over. So yeah. um, I, I've seen him. I saw him on Beaver Creek Road the other day with somebody pulled over. I've noticed the difference just in my—you know—I live in Oregon City, so. Most of my driving times after hours, but um, I've noticed the difference. I don't know if the community has, but that message doesn't take too long to get out. And I, I, I do think that we hear a lot about um, this committee hears a lot of complaints about neighborhood speeding. And there's you know a few things we can do. You know, we're talking about this campaign. Um, I, I guess, I guess, Bob, I think the message 
if there is a message back to Bill is that we you would like or you and a subcommittee would like to kind of sit down with Bill or or uh, or Chief Band and and <coughs> figure out you know what the messaging is what options they I don't know if the police has some good we we've gone looking for slogans or messaging and we've thought about signage that might sit on garbage cans or you know a variety of things that we have through public works some some things that we've seen other agencies do but I don't know how many of those were sponsored by the police department but um, in terms of just agreement at least that that's the program we should follow as a city so we want to do that right yes absolutely uh, we first need to put together a plan of action uh, and hopefully some kind of timetable and then get money figures together for and I'll be happy to look into costs of placemats you know if we first figure out about how many we'd need and then the cost of the garbage can stickers uh, which would really reach out to every neighborhood that's for sure but first we need to decide where we want to go the end result you're talking about a strategy aren't you yes Bob? right a plan of action and then move forward um, and I'm assuming we would want to get the blessing of the City Commission because we may very well be spending some of their money um, maybe physically for signage or just manpower to help us develop this so whatever I can do to help it get moving along why I'm pretty much available being retarded <laughs> I mean retired <laughs> um, hey mr. chairman so mr. chairman I have a quick question so I don't know if it's premature or not but you were discussing uh, the goal of having three traffic officers and that the chief was talking to the city manager is this a budgetary question only and is it appropriate for this group to say we endorse more enforcement and blah 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 um, we are in discussions of adding an officer in the next budget in July um, and so we're that will give us the two and a half bodies that we're looking for so then we just gotta find another half a body um, so we, our plans in place it's just a matter of timing so is it an advantage if one of the advisory committees that gets a lot of these speeding complaints and deals with these issues passes a motion endorsing the two and a half you have that in your hand when you walk in and talk to the city manager um, honestly I think we're past that at this point because um, we've already got approval for the 44th body it's just a matter of we're trying to do it now rather than wait until after July okay we're trying to get the ball rolling now rather than waiting until after July because um, what, what happens is that we have to backfill so we actually hire an officer send them to the police academy which takes 16 weeks get him trained which takes another 16 weeks and then what time he gets on patrol then we can dedicate somebody to traffic so it's kind of a domino effect of we got to get a new person hired and trained up and then pull off one of our senior guys to go into the traffic position okay so thanks it's, so it, it's a, it's just a matter of timing how about a retired person a thousand thirty nine hour policeman yeah and that's what we're currently doing and we're more than willing to look at that if we can find the right person yeah is there a P uh, public relations officer with it we have a PIO as well as a community outreach um, individual well, one of the things that just just struck me here as we were talking is it is, isn't is there a possibility of getting like a 15 minute or a 30 minute uh, discussion on public TV taped so that it's put into rotation on various subjects with maybe some some um, videos of various things just to illustrate the concept sure and just have it on a one subject basis and yeah that's a great idea you know we could take clips of from this traffic safety class probably and make it uh, pretty easily yeah um, maybe maybe some of those red light camera guys with both faces blurred out so yeah. that you don't really know who they are and Martin we can use this for his photo. we could use Martin's <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, your red light photo. We want to use it for a campaign. Oh. Okay. <laughs> 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 
No, that's a great idea. Um, we used to have a very good relationship with Willie Falls uh, TV, and since they've sold in the last couple of years, it's kind of. Uh, yeah, I, I just take a bunch of college classes that you know that way for fun. But it su suddenly struck me that yeah. this would be a good. Yeah, it might goes hand in hand with the campaign. Well, I mean, that's where, a, a good. Where would you post those on no, the city's website? Well, there's a public TV channel where our oh, okay. meeting is actually done, mm -hmm. and then just put it into that rotation. Oh, okay. so that Eleven Falls TV uh, mm -hmm. channels twenty eight and twenty three, and we can put it also on Vimeo. Yeah. And, and then when, on some of these, like the Hilltop Safety Fair, you can set up a, a loop on a on a one of those uh, TV uh, VCR TV sets and just re run, it, run it through the loop. Oh, but you're dating yourself, VCR. I know now it's DVD <laughs> and computer, but so you're you're talking about a public service announcement that would yeah. be focused on safety and yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff's available in the can. You can mm -hmm. buy it. Um, we might want to. There, there may be There's ways to insert the, that. The, the county, the county. If you remember, Joe Merrick. Mm -hmm. brought, Joe Merrick is uh, here on the same subject. He, he brought the county safety message mm -hmm. in the, in the form of a video. So, um, I mean, that's another partner right there. And then it's just a matter of getting it, you know, loaded. And Willamette Falls is pretty yeah. pretty willing to. Put They're that. looking for stuff. They're looking for stuff usually. Exactly. So looking for content. There's also social media. Oh yeah, it's huge. That's very powerful stuff. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you, Bill, for absolutely. The thank information. you. Did we want to get into this Myths Busters roundabout video? It's on the Should agenda. Do that. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. That'd be interesting. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> so at least you want to pass these out. No, I thought it's ready to go. I'm here. So, um, in light of trying to put in uh, some additional content for our meeting, make it worthwhile, and in consideration of all the discussions we've had with um, roundabouts, there's a couple things we've been kind of compiling and wanting to share with you guys. One of these was this video. Um, if you ever watched uh, Discovery Channel, we've got the show Mythbusters, and what I've always loved about that show um, is they take, you know, physics, science, and um, they bring it to a layman's level and kind of trying to explain, well, this is how the realities of this actually work. <coughs> and they did a really great video on bringing um, the, the roundabout concept um, to a layman's level and explaining the efficiency that you can observe through a roundabout. So we're going to show that um, for you for just a second. And then I've also included, this is an article that I just finished reading the other day. Um, it came out in this month's American Public Works Association magazine. And it's talking about the efficiency of roundabouts and the prevalence of them moving nationally or moved throughout the nation. Um, and it talks a lot about the national safety statistics. They did a, a pretty large um, study in Virginia um, regarding intersections and track new or redesigned intersections and tracked them for a four-year period and showed how um, roundabouts could have potentially lessened the impacts of the accidents that had occurred in those intersections for that four-year period. So I um, wanted to share that with you. So you feel free to take a look at this. It's got some um, very interesting information. And let's see if we've got audio. So we wanted to show you that. And then the backup document that I gave you um, talks about the safety, the safety improvements um, that are inherent with a roundabout, that you minimize or for all intents and purposes eliminate 90 degree strike angles for accidents. Um, if somebody does get hit, they get pushed into the roundabout. They're not getting pushed into uh, another vehicle or um, the oblique angle gives it a little bit more cushioning. Um, this example was with a four-way stop. Um, some of the intersections that we're looking at are currently signalized, so there are some differences, but it, it's a good concept. Um, and we just wanted to share that with you to let you know that neither of us have got stock in the roundabout company. Mm -hmm. It's just something that we think is a, a good direction 
um, that we should be considering where appropriate. Hey. Scott? ODA is looking at a couple roundabouts really? right now, and uh, they, the freight industry is really worried about it. So they had invited them out to Deschutes County Fairgrounds mm -hmm. and Portland Meadows to run tests with the biggest trucks they could come up with. They ran, and it's on YouTube. You can look under ODOT um, tests for big rigs or something like that. And um, they ran rigs of anywhere from 80 feet up to 205 feet, I believe, in length. And, it, and none, none of them had a problem going through a roundabout. So it was pretty amazing to watch the, the, the test. They took it through with no problems. That include the triple trailer? We're hmm. talking everything. Is that right? We're talking 200 feet long. Oh, is that right? Has a transformer in the middle of it. No kid. So, uh, mm. well, for just having, I just went to Ben last two, three weeks ago, before I went on active duty um, for the first time, and drove through their roundabouts. Um, I can tell you, it can be implemented. It can be, um, it can be aesthetically pleasing to the community. Um, it can be um, a nice little break to a monotonous drive, and I, I really enjoyed. It. I think they did a good job in their implementation. Um, and I think we can do as good a job, if not better, for the right locations. Have you guys got any feedback on the roundabout of the 213 and the Clackamas, or Clackamas River Drive and from public? We haven't got any complaints. Um, and I don't have any accident histories at that location. Um, but I can't, I can't tell you that people have contacted us telling us that they enjoy it. I love it. Yeah, I think the feedback on that is, is you know, mixed. I mean, I, I know the elderly <laughs> folks are concerned about roundabouts, and um, but even the elderly can learn how to use a roundabout. So I, I resent that, but I might. So you resemble that? <laughs> that too. <laughs> but are, my, are you my a roundabout, biggest, Tom? Is that my, what it is? My biggest concern with using the roundabouts is I tend to lose my track of which exit I want to get out of well that's interesting because Good um, signage. there is there uh, you know pedestrian concerns happen to be on the exit end of a, of a roundabout so that's that's one little piece that we need to think about when we're designing those is usually people are thinking ahead on entrance of the roundabout mm -hmm. it's kind of that exit piece you know in theory you're supposed to use your signal to exit out of a roundabout a lot of people don't I'm thinking yeah. more of the destination. I know, but still, it's <laughs> that thought about oh, now that I'm in the circle, you know, is How it safe to out? is it uh, safe to get out? Well, if we, have, we have an opinion from the public, uh, Francis. Please come up here, and so um, we can get it. I, uh, I'm a dual citizen of Canada and the U.S., and I just came back from spending six years working in. Speaking of microphone, DC. if you could. Yes. Is it on? <laughs> so I'm a dual citizen of the U.S. and Canada, and I just came back from working in Vancouver, B.C. for six years recently. And um, I lived in the Dunbar neighborhood of Vancouver. If you know Vancouver, B.C., that's the, the University of British Columbia is out at the end of the peninsula, and 150,000 people travel there and back every day. And I lived in the Dunbar neighborhood, which is just east of the University of British Columbia. I lived there before roundabouts were put in. And I can tell you that it was insane in the neighborhood. People were rushing to get their kids to school. People were rushing through trying to find faster ways to get to UBC. It was really unpleasant and dangerous to walk. The roundabouts went in every other block in most, on most streets in Dunbar. It was amazing. In a very short time, all the traffic slowed. Many people stopped using those streets to, to travel through to get someplace else. But, and then people in the neighborhood adopted the circles and started gardening them. The really, really important thing is that people started using the streets where they lived. Kids went out and played more. People visited with their neighbors more. All these really, really positive 
things happen because of these roundabouts in residential neighborhoods. And I, I can tell you because I saw it before and after. And I think one of the problems with being in the United States is we just are so isolated from what the rest of the world is doing. And let me tell you, they're way ahead of us. Now, the roundabouts that you experienced, were those true roundabouts or were those, what do they call those traffic calming? Traffic circles. They're traffic yeah. circles. Okay. But, but there's <clears throat> also roundabouts in major traffic areas all over Vancouver, BC now. North Vancouver, West Vancouver, it makes such a difference because Vancouver is a very international city and people, it's not uncommon to see six people go through every red light. I mean, after it turns red, they'll go through. So now, in many places, that's avoided because of the roundabouts. Mm -hmm. And where they don't have roundabouts, they now have traffic officers during rush hour making people stop when they're supposed to. <laughs> it's really incredible to see. Okay, thank, thank you. you for that. <laughs> yeah, what? Clackamas County did a major improvement at Wankers Corner when they put the roundabouts in, and that's from personal experience of using it as a four-way and using it as a roundabout. There's no comparison. There's two of them off the Sunnyside Road, too. And over by Forest Grove, there's a couple of them in Washington County on a main road that they use to get out to... Uh, well, we've got them in Sherwood, and yeah. the other thing I really like about them is you can't put a red light camera on a roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that really made an impression on me. <laughs> I've been here three weeks, That's which is why I got snagged. <laughs> I was coming behind a semi truck, I was yeah. behind him, yeah. and he goes through the light. Right. I don't see that it's red. Yeah. And then my wife in Florida, because the tags are Florida tags, gets a letter saying <laughs> you've got a, a ticket. What are you doing? And there's a face ghosted out in the seat. And the first thing my wife asks is, who the hell's in this seat next to you? Yeah. And I go, that's my cousin. I went to go to play golf. And he's like, okay. So that's my story. And you're sick of it. Yeah. Uh, John, you had several items that you wanted to add to the agenda. I'll let you pick and choose which one you think is. We still have a half hour to go. So well, which well, we one? We can get out early, but Thomas, you had a question, and I, I'll oh, do. I'm sorry. I suggest we do the Myers Road project because it, it's timely, and uh, we need an update on that. I was just wondering if we have any data on relative efficiency and safety of single lane versus the two lane roundabouts. I don't have any comparative information on that, but I bet you might be there. able to get that on Walker's Corner from who would that be? Clackamas County That'd be or Clackamas Lake County. Oswego? It's Clackamas County. Yeah. And that's a combination kind of like what's been proposed for uh, Leland Lynn uh, for the five leg roundabout. Similar in that part of it's two leg and part of it's not. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, two lane, part of it's not. Um, and there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of those kind of combination ones. True, full two lanes. I'm trying to think if there's one in the region, but Kittleson and Associates. Uh, is traffic engineer that uh, you guys, Sedmer, you guys use Kittleson quite a bit, yep. don't you? Um, they, uh, they're like, I mean, there's a lot of people that know a lot about roundabouts, but they, they're kind of a national expert in roundabouts, and they've kind of got the most history, I think. The one over there by the IKEA, over by the airport, I think that's a true two-lane full roundabout, isn't it? I don't know. That one's at the end of the little thing there. Yeah. I don't know if it's a Oh, no, but they, it is a roundabout. They have a single lane that continues the loop when you get no. to the back of the hair. That, that's more of a U, of a cul-de-sac U-turn bulb. Uh, we could ask Kittleson if they've got any data on two-lane roundabouts for you. Hey, John. John yes. Uh, before you launch into this thing, or maybe afterwards, uh, that coffee shop down the bottom of the mm -hmm. hill, can you maybe give us an update on that? I was several days now. I mean, I've been going down there in the cup. I mean, Senator, we talked about that at the beginning of oh, the session before your arrival. Yeah, Bob wants to bring it back, so we're going to bring it back future meeting. We'll bring back the Kittleson study that okay. they did and talk through that. Um, so, can you bring up the 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 
Myers Road, Myers Road um, preferred alternative um, PDF. Yeah. Okay. Is that the one I just emailed you? Uh -huh. Okay. It's a big file. It's going to take a second. So, uh, Martin and I and planning department uh, has a representative as well, have been working with um, David Evans and Associates on um, a c concept plan that really is extending Myers Road from its uh, located where it's located where it, where it tees into 213 and also where it essentially it's not really dead ends but where it tees into high school lane on the high school side so this drawing here is fresh off the press I mean we've not really we're about to put it on our website but we thought we'd share it with you we have been working uh, we've got stakeholders okay. that include the school district and um, the community college ODOT as well as we've been talking we've asked the consultant team to start communicating with the property owners um, there's other stakeholders like the um, I can't remember if it's BPA but the power administration through there parks and recreation TriMet yep so um, this concept plan is a $150,000 contract with um, David Evans and Associates to um, put together a plan that we could then adopt through the land use process and um, hopefully get buy-in from the property owners and maybe even um, agree to dedication right away. And really Myers Road seems like a pretty straightforward alignment, but there is things like that BPA. There's ob obstructions along there. Uh, between the BPA easement, the wetlands, um, working with the various property configurations. Um, we cross uh, several property owners, uh, the city and its parks, the school districts and its transit facility, which in, um, I think what I'll do is use the mouse here just so that you guys can see this as well. But, um, so, the school district, you know, that's the high school right here. This is Myers Road. This is High School Lane. This is the proposed transit facility for the school district. Uh, this is the proposed park. This is two, 213 and um, Myers Road. So this alignment in blue here is kind of our conceptual preferred alignment. We looked at three different alignments that brought it in various angles across these properties and uh, <coughs> around, you know, over the top through these red, these red things indicate where the power, uh, fa foundations for the power towers are. Um, so trying to figure out how to do that without um, compromising in too big a way some of the properties that we have to create, uh, avoiding too much in terms of property remnants this is, for instance, this, this corner here is this, the community college, but the property line for the neighboring property is along here. And, you know, here's another little remnant. But trying to minimize those remnants, try not to uh, butcher anybody's property such that there's still economic development potential for every property owner. And uh, really the biggest issue that came up was how to intersect the TS transportation system plan calls for a uh, loader road connection between Beaver Creek and Glen Oak Road to help move traffic, uh, you know, out of the neighborhood out to this way to help uh, move traffic that might be associated with the Beaver Creek concept plan. And so, trying to this this piece uh, is all on private property. There's no public right of way for loader road at this point. So, trying to negotiate where we would bring that across. Again, looking at other alignments that might have brought it through through here uh, was a consideration. Again, trying not to further disrupt properties too much. And we really kind of came to a point where the school district agreed, because we were pushing pretty hard, that high school lane is already 
acting as a connection and could be, you know, the condition on the park property was to widen that to more of a collector status. So we got buy-in, uh, at least uh, in a verbal buy-in, and it's now a condition of approval for this development that Loader Road, be, they dedicate right away for Loader Road across the school district property, and then we'll worry about this alignment later. But that helped us quite a bit to figure out you know, do we have to put some kind of an intersection or a roundabout or something along through one of these properties? And by putting it here, it, in my opinion, keeps it much cleaner and less impactful to what really this is zone, this area out here is zone um, campus industrial, which means we could see industrial development out there or we could see, you know, some kind of an educational expansion out there. There's lots of kinds of uses that are not residential. What's the green color allowed. shading? The green is what we have as natural, uh, a natural resource corridor. So for instance, this up in here is considered wetland. So there's signs of wetland along some of those, cor along that corridor. So we do have to cross that. So the other piece is just, this is a loop road around the community college here. Um, the community college is conditioned as they further develop the, their, con, their, their master plan, which includes additional buildings. Um, if you remember, they were successful in passing a bond that would allow them to do some, some additional growth. But in order to do that, they need to expand, either expand this intersection or provide another connection so that um, traffic would have either option to enter from, from here or from the new Myers Road or from their back, uh, I think this is Claremont back here. So uh, this red line represents a connection road between the college and Myers Road. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's moving along well. If there's some criteria that we, uh, Martin, you wanna yep. read through that? Or there's sure. some of the criteria that we heard from the property owners and really our stakeholder group that was important so if you go through that, then we can talk about the section that we're talking about. Sure. So the project management team, when we started working on this, we set up a, a list of project criteria that we wanted to use for evaluation purposes for A, developing our alternatives, and then B, comparing them against one another. So I'm just going to read through these for you. When we make the website public, all of these criteria will be published, um, so you'll be able to get a better look at them. But our primary first was consistent with the current TSP, um, with the regional transportation plan, with the school district's um, plans, with our parks and recreations plan, and with the community colleges um, plans. So there are various master plans, but we wanted to make sure we were consistent with. And the preferred alternative maintained consistency with all of the relative master plans. So we also wanted to make sure that it met the street functional, functional class requirements for um, the Myers Road extension. Um, we wanted to make sure we provided options for connecting to future Loader Road extension, which um, we think we've provided there and came up with a preferred alternative for the Loader Road alignment. We wanted to make sure that we maximize multimodal environment. So um, John, do you want to pan up to that top right corner? There you go. So this is our um, preferred street typical. And you'll notice uh, this is a face, you're facing east in this direction. So what's on the left-hand side is basically the north side of the road and the south, um, the right-hand side would be the south side of the road. We've included um, six-foot bike lanes on both sides of the roads with a three-foot um, bicycle buffer, so that's a striped, dual striped bicycle buffer. You'll see some of those if you travel through Sherwood, mm -hmm. Twalton. Um, it gives the cyclists that much more um, uh, protection and uh, a little bit more maneuvering space. Um, it's a single lane, each direction, 12 foot wide lanes with a divided median. We can um, do planted vegetation within portions of the medium and also allow for turn pockets where needed. And then on the south side of the road, we're requiring on-street parking, um, a seven-foot parking area. Uh, we did not require it on the north side of the road. The concern there being um, sightline impairments from kids coming out of the community college as well as the buses coming out of the bus barn. We, wanted, we didn't want to add anything else. 
to kind of complicate those turns coming out of um, the north side of the road there. And then we have our divided um, uh, sidewalks, which will be with our new water quality improvements based on um, the new water quality stormwater uh, manual, and then a dedicated five-foot sidewalk. So meets all of the intents of our multimodal um, requirements within the TSP. Have, have you guys looked at uh, Washington County is looking at this on a couple of projects, set, you know, separated bike lane, taking the bike lane and putting it completely out, we, having it next to a pedestrian path, but you know, separating those by, by six inches. So there's like a, a, a dedicated bike lane and then pedestrian and they're, but they're separated. We, uh, so the bike lane is completely separated from the road? Completely taken and it's attached to a yeah. sidewalk. So we actually did talk about that during the um, stakeholders discussions. And the concern with that was the, um, the amount of right of way that we wanted to be asking from, from everyone. And I know it, it's, it's not it all different. adds up to some extent, and all, it's like a wash. But that was one of the things that we talked about and we decided we didn't want to do that for Whatever some reason. of some of it, we talked about a shared use path mm -hmm. and uh, eliminating one of the bi paved bike lanes yep. and putting on the, the shared use side. path on one side. But it's not shared; they're separated. Yeah. One's separated by another by six inches. This would be so shared by bike with bikes and pedestrians. So, sh typical shared use path. We were looking at fourteen to sixteen foot shared use path. Mm -hmm. So, we we talked about doing that in front of the high school. Uh, bus farm and we had some concerns about first of all tree plantings and then just site distance coming around the corner on those so what we uh, what we looked at well the other piece that we follow is our we've got a transportation system plan <coughs> which calls for a shared use path it's actually the, called the loop trail that goes basically around the exterior of the city so that's what this one I mean so this purple dot dotted line right here is more mm -hmm. of that uh, wider pathway that could be bicycle friendly or pedestrian friendly. That would that would be in addition to the bike lanes that we have on Myers Road and the sidewalks that we have on Myers Road. So it'd be it might incorporate the sidewalk along this r route, but it would put that bike lane on the loop trail mm -hmm. of the community college. So if you walked around the community college, there's a there's a soft path there now. This would be a hard path that would go, that would take them off of Myers Road, which we thought was appropriate because of the uses for that bike lane are more likely to be community college or through the school district. Uh, and there's a pathway through here as well. So the idea is we didn't take it much further than that because it's kind of reaching outside of our planning area. But the, uh, the TSP calls for a shared use path along um, along Loader Road that takes you out into the Beaver Creek concept area. So that's that's kind of the model that we've been working for with regard to a road section. So yeah, this seemed like what I have seen, it's much mm -hmm. more, I think, I mean, it's it's considerably more, more safer because that bike is no longer part of the, 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 the road, but it's also separated from the, from the pedestrians. And they have their own essentially exclusive right of way where the bikes could just zoom and pedestrians could walk. They're separated, but no longer in the part of the street uh, interaction with the vehicles. Yeah. Another well, option I've seen for protected bike lanes is, well, Broadway in downtown Portland, up by the PSU camps, a good example where you have the traffic lane, the parking lane, the bike lane, and then the sidewalk where you have that row of parking. Yeah. between the bike lane and the yeah. moving traffic. How much grade are you going to have to cut off there? That's 10 feet up to the top of that hill from mm -hmm. 213. We haven't looked at cross sections or profile of this yet, but yeah, you're gonna, <laughs> we're going to have to cut in through here. So, so you need a wall to keep people from falling over the edge or something. Or a, or a cut slope. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's going to be steep. Not yeah. So, yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Big rocks in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I hear I hear the point about the various options. There's a lot of options. In fact, um, let me say our planner uh, Kelly just went to the um, there's a there's a conference on um, 
bike paths and that she just went to recently. Oh, mm -hmm. it's the Oregon Active Transportation yeah. Summit? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about some of those ideas. Um, circle track, I think they call them bike tracks, right? Where there, where there's a approachable curb or something that a bicyclist can be on and then a, a separate curb for even <laughs> the sidewalks. We did consider that. One of the challenges that I think is associated with that kind of solution is we're not, that's not this long of a, of a roadway section. So we we still have to match into the bike lanes that are on the other segment of Myers Road up by the high we school. We had transitioned back, but mm -hmm. well, you're yeah. building a brand new road. It's, it's an opportunity to something different yeah, yeah and try it out what was the criteria for having parking on the south side I don't I don't really see much of a need for it there yeah a lot of this was driven by some of the prior work that we did with the parks and the school district so parks on their master planning is showing on-street parking along uh, Myers Road so along this section of mm -hmm. Myers Road um, we had it at one point in time in front of the school district property as well, and we decided that we'd, we'd, we'd rather not use that because there's this tendency for people to park in their cars and then not use the, if they're headed to the park, not use the crosswalk. Instead, just cross diagonally in, a, in what's a little bit of a corner there. Mm -hmm. So um, we felt like we could still live with the on-street parking on this side. We don't know the kind of uses along here yet, and whether or not we continue that on-street parking or not is debatable. But so this, we're, are we going to build? Would the would it be that we would build the cross section and hope the property owners can form, or would we wait until the property was done and then make the street conform? Hopefully, we're building the street early. We, w we would really like to see Myers Road be built right. because of the traffic. So I think what we're going what we're going to agree to is a section and I mean we're leaning pretty heavily <coughs> on this on this particular mm -hmm. section here. Um, we think it does provide something different. That three foot sh buffer is we don't have that situation in Oregon City anywhere where we've got a three foot buffer. We talked about putting the, the vehicles on uh, Putting the bike lane curb tight and doing kind of like what you're talking about on Broadway, it it does require additional section because you've also need to provide that same door opening buffer on both sides of the car. So mm -hmm. it is you know um, unless you want to have the concern about you know an opening the door into a bicyclist, which isn't that great either. So we thought this was <coughs> it's it's above and beyond what we have now in any in any location in Oregon City and it doesn't require that odd transition mm -hmm. across an intersection or uh, except uh, I think you're building six six uh, nine eighteen feet of the structural s section for your roadway that is way more expensive than building mm -hmm. six feet of the you know sidewalk supporting pedestrian so there's way more cop money you're spending on, on that bike lane per linear foot than you would do if, if you separate that and take it out of the street section. I mean, you got a sub base, you got all that rock, asphalt. You're building to the, to the real section. Right. You'd be, we would not change the road section for this nine feet of right. pavement. That's road. what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. You're really building a four-lane highway, I mean, four-lane street, and then restricting the use of the outer lanes. So you're only traveling on two, the two inner lanes, and the outer lanes are for other things. But the structure is still a four, a four lane street. Yeah. Whereas if you can can segregate it out a little bit more, you could build maybe a three lane street, or a lane, two and a half lane street. I think it would probably, it would be cheaper separating it and doing it this way. Mm -hmm. I mean, have your consultant; they could figure out the cost. Yeah. yeah. This section is what's conditioned upon. The other little challenge we have is we would love to be doing this concept plan without the influence of the school districts and the school and the <laughs> cities. So the school districts doing their land use approval, they're in the queue. In fact, they had a their first planning commission meeting last night. And then the parks is moving through to adoption of their master plan as well. Mm -hmm. 
So we, we, we struggled a little bit with trying to not have that influence kind of guide our decisions on uh, what the road section should look like, yet they were, their land use timeline was much uh, further ahead than, than our. But, um, but that would still only affect just the, the northern 200 feet of that ex potential extension. The rest of that half mile or so can be done differently. I don't see what what's holding you. I mean, I'm sure they could work. You could work on an agreement with them and change. It's a planning commission that would have to be in on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, but I don't see right that. now the condition is specific to what the section would look like as a at a minimum. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Within that section, we could ask for something different. I, I was wondering about those short reverse curves between the bus facility and the park's property. What was the reason for putting that? And I can see it might maximize park property and minimize impact on the <coughs> peak property. I think when the parks and recreation guy came in, he had uh, Myers Avenue just going straight across there on his concept plan. Uh, well, I don't. I've mm -hmm. I've not seen it that way. We've always shown it. Part of it was just yeah, trying to maximize the uses on either side of this line for. Park property. It also then, winds up with properties further to the west, to the south there too. Yeah. So if we brought this straight through, it would leave a remnant. So, you know, that again was one of those um, pieces where traffic. we had mm -hmm. we had Soul stepped in traffic. with our um, concept planning until the school district and the parks had already put together their concept. It's a traffic calming device. Mm -hmm. Those are 400 foot radius curves. We've uh, agreed that um, the speed along Myers Road, with the exception of up near the high school, would be 30 mile an hour mm -hmm. uh, collector. So, um, I can certainly see though the money saving, like <laughs> you were talking about, on uh, even the sub layers necessary if you had the bike lanes right adjacent to the sidewalks rather than part of the. Mm -hmm roadway itself you just wouldn't have to build for cars you just have to build for yeah so it could be a, a substantial savings there and I think that what's part of our responsibility is to look at things like that too it's an interesting concept I hadn't thought about at all this is a better plan than I saw 15 years ago <laughs> it, it, it is a, a Clarification of that plan. Okay. Well, I was wondering too. Isn't, isn't there a, uh, isn't there a soccer field on the east you know, side the of 213 the over there, where uh, uh, Myers Road will be going through? Uh, yeah, through the community college right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right in there. Was that going to be built or replaced and built somewhere else? Or? I don't know what the college has in mind for that. Um, they recognize that it's going to impact that field. Let's do soccer fields. And you had said that area is zone commercial. Is that? I'm mean, excuse me, industrial. It's in uh, it's campus, campus industrial. industrial. I think. I think. That's Describe that. It, and how many acres are in the campus industrial, roughly? Everything uh, we're looking at. I think there? this piece right here is 15. I think this one's uh, 12. Um, Everything down to three. Go, to uh, green I'm, I'm trying to remember how many acres are there. It's it's probably 40 acres in total of of campus industrial, and um, less than that because of the new stormwater ordinances. Because of the what? New stormwater ordinances. You have less developable air, area too. Top of well, there, you're right. There is a. I don't think it's got to do with the ordinance, but it's got this well, natural I'm, resource corridor here that's probably going to be impacted by that. But. Um, uh, I think, uh, so you asked me how many acres, I guess I don't know, but I think it's around 40 acres. That doesn't include, say, this, this wetland corridor that, you know, may have some real constraints about building on top of it. So um, having the road there, does that increase the shovel readiness of this area? Yeah, it would. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a value to that. 
I so agree. the city's creating a value to that. So I don't know if you can leverage that in your negotiations, but. Well, keep in mind, anybody that develops along there is going to be paying SDCs, and they may be con conditioned to build off-street improvements. For instance, the school district, you know, they've got to build their front into Myers Road, and they've got to build, uh, they're conditioned to build Loader Road. Now, if the city were to move forward with a project without development on these properties, that's kind of this, that's the decision that we'd have to make. And, um, you know, hopefully we don't have to pay for right-of-way, but we're making that kind of a decision. And that then makes this property, this property, all these properties along here a lot more, with a lot more development potential. When that happens, then they're also going to pay a transportation SDC that, in theory, reimburses the city for that and can be used on some other project somewhere else. When I went, when I went to the park meetings on this, one of the adjacent property owners was there, and he basically made the statement that he was just waiting for Myers Road to show up before he turned to, went into development. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely an advantage. So, again, would the city consider assessing the appropriate value to the properties abutting that with a 10-year assessment so that there's a financial incentive for them to then turn the property over and get some uh, industrial campus industrial started there so rather than basing everything on an SDC and not having any leverage to get them to start developing you provide that leverage with an assessment district. How we pay for this project is really kind of not on the table yet. I mean, we're thinking about it. The property owners may be thinking about it, but we haven't really had that conversation yet. We're still trying to figure out. That's right. Yeah, I think you should think about leveraging it so that there would be an incentive for them to develop. But obviously, you have to measure it so that there's a value to them and a value to the city. Hey John, how how feasible is it really to do that high school avenue extension? I mean, you got it's going largely through the environmental zone. I mean, it seems like the permitting would be like pretty tough and pretty costly. And and the louder road it, it, it intersection on Beaver Creek will be a lousy intersection once it's a four way or just because it doesn't not seem like make any sense. It's it's not in there at 90. It's going to be one of those where you can be a, a bear cat to use. Not so buses. so I would say pretty much from the high school property, and really the alignment specific alignment through the high school property may skirt this. There's really no way for us to get through to get a loader road connection through without impacting these resource areas. Um, but Loader Road in the Beaver Creek concept plan shows it turning and teeing into Beaver Creek Road instead, which could put it pretty close to some of these common flag lot driveways that might bring it in in a little different, slightly different alignment here. So I, this line is a line. It's kind of a, there's... We're well, you were talking about preferred alternative, and that's why I thought this was a... Preferred. Yeah, we're, I mean, our main question is how to get load, how to get loader road connected to Myers Road if we can't figure out where that happens then it really impacts the concept plan for Myers Road so I think we've landed on the connection point is, is mm -hmm. right down here okay. at, and then from there we've talked we're talking to the school district we think that alignment we don't want to impact their ball field so we know through there the alignments going to be pretty close well, right on the property line there's some ponds and things back in here that we're going to have to, you know, get creative about maneuvering through that. And my thought is, is there's, there's, you know, between, you know, somewhere on Loader Road and here, there's a lot of design interpretation that's kind of like what we're talking about with Myers Road. So that took a bit of time. So um, I appreciate the comments. We'll, we will follow up on the, um, on the. Path. We we did hear from our traffic consultant as well as the um, David Evans consultant that there was some concerns about the shared use path, particularly um, in front of the bus barn that would be off road, kind of like what you're talking about. 
And then there was this question about whether or not that was really the right place given the destination and given the opportunity to build that shared use path or a path. Lost my mouse, but um, there it is. Now, now shared path and then dedicated bike lane, they're two different things. Right, but we've still got to move pedestrians along Myers Road, mm -hmm. and we still got to move bicycles along Myers Road. I know, but you're moving them. I'm just saying it's a, if they're like on the one path versus like separated path, they're two different concepts. Yeah, right. So it's a matter of do they put, sit side by side only on different... They're six inches out, uh, above each other. Right, right. Yeah, I just... Just something to look into. Yeah, we'll, we will, we'll ask that question again. Okay, Bob, that's probably... Okay, um, let's see, we are now into communications. Does anybody have anything of importance to discuss with us? Okay, future agenda items. I'm assuming, John, that you'll bring in the Gaffney Lane, the couplet design downtown, and the 99 Bridge issue. And Dutch, and Dutch Brothers. <laughs> yeah, and Dutch Brothers. Does anybody have any future agenda items they think are important for us to get scheduled? What's going to be the process for the uh, safety uh, campaign? Uh, we're still looking to get more information gathered before we bring it back for discussion. Is that the idea? That's my concept. Okay. Yes. All right. I do have a question for the chair and us. Are we going to have a June, mid, June, July, August meeting, or how's that going to affect? June is what we typically do. July and August we typically don't. Okay. Do. July and August, um, I think would maybe dependent on how we're doing with this safety campaign. Good. But this we still, I, it would might be my desire and suggestion that we, at this time, plan on not having July and August meetings unless we have a strong reason for doing so. Yeah, I don't think we're going to hit the school year in time. So if, we're, if our campaign is about you yeah. know, trying to target, you know, we're too late for that. So. Um, and, you know, I guess back to the safety camp, we never kind of circled back on whether or not, you know, you guys thought about, you know, what the preferences were. We're still kind of assuming that we're just supposed to put together a, a campaign. So I don't know if you guys did any of that. Personally, uh, I like three or four different models all mixed up together so that you don't see the same sign all over everywhere. You have, you stop, you see, slow let the kids cross the street uh watch out for bicycle you know those see various messages on various places more around safety than more around one safety. about speeding maybe but well, the other ones safety. might be distracted driving or yeah anything. exactly exactly well i'm looking for the, su the success of this being based on the uh, support by the neighborhood associations. Absolutely. I think that if that were the case, and we got a groundswell of support from those uh, people citywide, you could develop a model here that would be uh, adopted statewide. This could be a statewide model. You dream well. Well, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not that hard. No. Really, if you, if you break it down into components, and if you get the public behind you, and, and what more do you need than, than safe driving, you know? Absolutely. It's, it's like, uh, where was it, Dodge City? Leave your guns at the, at the city limits. But when you get into the city of Oregon City, you drive safely. And there's all kinds of ways you can get the, get the message out. And what I'm thinking is, if we get the support of the public and the, and the neighborhoods, uh, then the, uh, I don't want to back the city commission into a, into a into a corner but I mean how, how can you how can you not it's a win-win situation is what I'm saying basically how could we not do it not without getting the yeah. buy-in of right. the neighborhoods right. and the exactly. PTAs and the like. exactly exactly now we could we could do it really like Bob said if we do it right it could be an example for other cities in the, in the state a uh, good example last night Jackie Hammond Williams the manager of the farmers market explaining the POP program 
to us that they have up there. And that was originated right here at our farmer's market here in Oregon City. And that has become a nationwide uh, program. Other cities from across the nation have called her to ask how she's put that together. In fact, they even had a group from Vancouver, B.C. call and say, how did you put that together? Well, she put it together so good yeah. that that's happened. And we could do it with the, tra the transportation safety. I, th I think the neighborhoods are the key to this, and they're also the strength. Microsoft got started in a garage, so at Walt Disney. <laughs> well, same thing with the traffic safety program. Not to mention uh, Apple. Yeah. And, and right. Bob, uh, you give up some of this billboard space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> give it up? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been paper. Yeah, that's yeah. been long gone. <laughs> I wonder, like, what? I mean, there's are there other communities that, that have done what we're trying to do? I mean, I think has anybody? I really do. <coughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I wait a minute. Wait a minute. We showed oh, you. We shared with you lots of examples of what yeah. other agencies have done at the last meeting. Well, that was part of your homework to look at those and find other for other agencies. But I'm talking about other other groundswell community. Uh, Initiated efforts. Are we talking the same, same language? Well, I think like uh, that. What was that one that Portland had? The drive like your kids, drive like your neighbors, or drive like your children live here. I think is what that campaign. That's pretty much community-driven program. That that uh, city of Portland may have been involved, but I think it's more driven through a community. I'm those, not trying, those I'm not trying to downplay the importance of that. I'm just I'm I'm saying most of the successful ones are driven through the community, not <laughs> by the agency as much. Yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. Right. <clears throat> right. Okay. Anybody have anything else? This meeting is.